Um, should we move on to some other politics of the day? Train strikes 18 months down the line as left are striking. We've just heard as well there's going to be London Overground. Train strikes are on the horizon the end of this month and the start of March. I think the public may feel a bit confused because the Conservatives at the end, latter part of last year, were saying, right, we've got a solution. We're going to enforce this minimum strike service bill to make sure that sort of transport, healthcare, critical infrastructure isn't totally scuppered. But what we're finding is when that legislation is tested, it's not really working. Why is that? Yeah, the government's really struggling on, on multiple fronts. And partly it's having to do battle not just with the workers, but with the sort of general public as well. Because there is a large degree of sympathy for some professions, less so for others. Train drivers tend to be at the sort of lower end of the spectrum of support. Um, but yeah, ultimately, there was this minimum strike legislation that was meant to be enforced. The issue the government's got is that people are, are ultimately still rejecting the, the pay negotiations that have been going on. We've seen this in the rail sector. We've also seen this with recently with consultants as well. They very, very, very narrowly rejected the government's pay offer. So just because the government is sort of trying to drag unions kicking and screaming to provide minimum service levels doesn't mean it's automatically happening because it's then beholden on the rail operating firms to then start prosecuting people uh, if they fail to uphold the minimum service levels. And, and presumably the train operating companies have just looked at that and just gone, we don't want to go down that road. That's not going to improve our rail service. Absolutely, yes. So that's which, which seems the, ironic to the public because they're thinking, well, hang on a bit, the legislation's there to provide a minimum service. Yeah, they're, they're, so they're, there's this sort of initial few months, really, where the legislation is being tested and where, obviously, it'll be up to, to see which side sort of blinks first. But it's sort of fallen back on the government. People will say, well, you know, you brought in this legislation. It hasn't had the desired effect that we wanted it to. We're coming up to an election year. People are looking at public services and wondering constantly whether or not they're sort of good enough for them. So this will be another sort of uh, nail in the coffin, if you like. It seemed like strike action had pretty much been abated towards the end of last year. But now you've just talked about the consultants and their pay offer, the train strikes now overground, leering their sort of head again. It, it's a real tension that the, the government haven't managed to come to a, a kind of conclusion that says, OK, pay, conditions getting public services working and running, it's all too difficult to balance all those things at once. It certainly is. I mean, it's what happens when you have a sort of economy which has seen flatlining growth, taxes at, you know, their record highest since the Second World War, and then a government saying they want to bring them down while improving public services. Now, obviously, the government's argument is it wants to increase things like productivity. One of the sort of more interesting flip sides to this, I think we'll probably end up coming on to in the next year or so, is... If we do have an incoming Labour government, what are they going to do about these sorts of things? Mm. A Labour government has said that it would sort of take more seriously uh, negotiations with unions, but it's never really putting a sort of final uh, pay offer on the table and saying, oh, we would have offered this much money instead of the government's offering this much. They may find that they're um, sort of in as much trouble as the government now. Uh, you've got a very wide political brief, Aubrey. Let's take you to Northern Ireland. I mean, just tell us how significant it is that we've now got a power-sharing agreement finally in place after more than two years of deadlock and it does look as if they're all going to be back at Stormont making decisions as they as they should be under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. Yes, well, hopefully. I mean, we've still, yeah, got, to yeah, they still, want still to got to see hold our breath the, for a little bit yeah. longer. But yeah. all of the, you know, the white smoke was there last night. We've got to see the sort of details of the legislation. And certainly the DUP are hoping that that lines up with everything that they have t sort of been told. So, again, this is a very delicate situation. Mm. But hugely important because Northern Ireland has been without a sort of government, if you like, for... And it's flipped in the meantime, years. hasn't it? Sinn Féin has become the, the, the biggest party. And so this is going to be a different sort of power-sharing agreement because the DUP is going to be the number two. Exactly, yes. And, I mean, of course, the way that Northern Ireland works is the sort of First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, they're kind of the same position, right? It's, it's a power-sharing role rather than it being necessarily one that sort of takes the lead and the other that takes the back seat. However, there are questions about what this means for the future of... Uh, you know, a potential united Ireland. There was some concern from the unionist, the hardline unionist side, that agreeing to this deal might mean that, for example, the UK is giving up or sort of softening its ability to diverge from the EU, potentially meaning that that creates more conditions for a united Ireland. There are others who argue, actually, Northern Ireland's kind of got the best of both worlds, so voters there would be very happy being close to the, both the EU and the UK. Um, I think the deadline for uh, an executive being formed is the 8th of February. So we've only got about a week or two left to be able to sort of say with certainty that this is really good news for the people of Northern Ireland. Aubrey, thank you so much. Careful, clear political analysis on a whole <laughs> uh, range of different stories this morning. Really appreciate your time.